freedom is a is a great word. Our president has been using it a lot. I mean, more politically than otherwise. But um, pray for him tonight. By the way, <laughs> poor guy. <laughs> Who would want that? Do you know? Have you heard? Uh, did a little again? He did. He got nominated. Good. Um, so I want to show you a new book that's going to come out on freedom to reach the farther reaches of uh, our thinking, not Mars, but here on Earth. It's uh, I'll back up one if you could. Um, it's called Setting Your Pet Free. Oh, now, I love that. now, my uh, little doggy's name is Butch, and so he did the foreword. But <clears throat> next slide here. It says, does your pet exhibit any of the following behaviors or attitudes? Belligerence. <laughs> pride and arrogance. Fear of impending doom. Anxiety attacks. Bad habits. Life out of balance. Distorted self-perception. Demonic pig obsession. Rejection. Oh. Unhealthy escapism. Or carrying unnecessary burdens. Feeling all washed up. Grumpiness. Criminal behavior. <laughs> Setting your pet free is filled with practical steps to unleash all of the latent potential in your beloved pet, whether fish, fowl, reptile, or mammal. Setting your pet free can be the key to unlocking your friend's cage. After a few months of studying this small volume, your pet will be transformed. See what some satisfied readers have experienced. Acceptance. Joy and friendship. Happiness in the midst of hardship. Sending your pet free work for me. <laughs> Isn't that classic? <clears throat> Last week we talked about sanctification, which is God's will for our life. Uh, and to be honest with you, there is no plan B. If we are not on that track and you want to live with God, uh, and I've seen it, He may torpedo your ministry may have set your schedule, whatever else it takes to get you back on the path. And uh, uh, it is character before a career. It is maturity before ministry. It is being before doing. And whenever a society or culture people get that reversed and you start doing without being, it's just doing. But you're a living being, not a doing. And, um, and a relationship with God is the center of all of that. In fact, everything I have to say all comes back to one critical issue. We're all here because of the fall, and God only has one plan, and that's to reestablish again and present us pure, spotless, and undefiled. I mean, that's God's great plan, is to restore this fallen humanity. And you and I have the privilege to reach people for Christ and build them up in the Lord. That's, that's what the church is here for. If it was uh, just to get us born again, he would, uh, we'd be born again and raptured into eternity, but we're here for a purpose. Truthfully, everybody here is on one rung of a recovery ladder helping the next person below them make the next step in life. And, and that's why we're here. I used to keep a sign on my desk, thank God for people's problems, for without them, I wouldn't have a ministry. <laughs> now, if you're somewhat familiar with me or a message or going to conference, you may have seen this before, but this is a leveling ground. We all have to get on the same plane uh, in terms of uh, mental strongholds and or defense mechanisms, or flesh patterns, whatever you choose to call them, essentially the same, uh, functionally. Uh, it depends on what discipline you've been raised in. We're all seeing the same phenomena. We may have different names for it or titles for it. But uh, Now think about it for a moment. Here you are, you come to Christ, and you're a brand new creation in Christ, and you read in the Bible that old things have passed away and all things have become new, that you're no longer in Adam, you're in Christ, you're no longer in the flesh. Uh, you're in Christ. In fact, if you're in the flesh, according to Romans 8, you're not a Christian. Uh, now, the flesh still remains, and so you and I have a choice whether we're going to walk by the flesh or by the Spirit, and that's a choice that we have. And you say, well, how do you know? Well, you know. Don't you? The deeds of the flesh are evident, aren't they? Impurity, immorality, immorality uh, inferiority, insecurity, you know. Outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, drunkenness, crowsiness. See, I memorized all those. If you do them all, you can memorize them better. And um, 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. See, what's coming out? It isn't what goes in a man that defiles him. It's what comes out. And for out of your heart flows the issues of life. So watch over your heart with all diligence, Scripture advises us. Well, anyway, uh, so you read that and you say, well, you know, I guess I believe that, but how come I still feel the same? Kind of? Struggle with the same old thoughts? Kind of, don't you? I mean, this is a legitimate question. I mean, we're not trying to be phonies about it. We're, we're real people, and we struggle too. And the, the whole growth process, in one sense, is a struggle. You are working out your salvation. Uh, let me see if I can explain why, when you come to Christ, even though you are, at that moment, a brand new creation in Christ, what we talked about last week is that positionally, you're a child of God right now, who is in the process of becoming like Christ. But let me give you a theological explanation and then a kind of an illustration of it. When Adam and Eve uh, were created, God created them to be both physically and spiritually alive. If they ate of the tree of the not of good and evil, on that day they would surely die. They ate and they died. Physically? No. No, actually he lived over 900 years physically, but he died spiritually, which means that his soul was no longer in union with God. His body was in union with his soul. That's what physical life is. If you physically die, what happens? Adds it from the body present with the Lord. Essentially, to die means to separate from, and to be alive means to be in union with. Now hang on to that, because a little later we're going to talk about what it means to be alive in Christ and dead to sin. Sin's still here, isn't it? Still powerful, still appealing. But in one way, death is the ending of a relationship, not existence. So sin is still here. And death is still imminent. Physical death is. Uh, but because of that, because of sin, they were separated from God. They died spiritually. And consequently... Every one of their descendants were born physically alive, spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.1. Having been born dead. Born dead. Still born? No. Born physically alive, but spiritually dead. Now that was true uh, throughout the Old, Old Testament. Now the good news is, and the gospel is, is that Jesus came to give us life. And so I mentioned last week, why it is so disastrous for us to struggle only about a third of the gospel. You know, sin separated us from God. He dealt with the sin so we can have a ministry of reconciliation. We can be reconciled to God. But what Jesus came to give us was life. What Adam and Eve lost in the fall was life. Now, this is no small thing, and it has a huge impact on how we present the gospel. I think people out here are desperately searching for something in life. And if all we give them is the cross, well, thank God for Good Friday, folks, but resurrection is what we celebrate and celebrate in Easter. No resurrection, no hope. No new life. And, uh, and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even if he dies. He will live spiritually, even if he dies physically. You with me? So, here I am, I came into this world, you did too, born dead in my trespasses and sins. I had neither the presence of God in my life, nor the knowledge of God's ways. And so I learned to live my life independent of God. So did you. We all learn differently, and that's what we're going to explain this afternoon. Uh, but we all learn how to succeed, cope, survive, whatever, in our natural heritage, in our natural life. Relying on our own strength and resources, or that of other you know, fallen human beings. And then one day you come to Christ, born again, brand new creation in Christ. All things have passed away, all things have become new. You're no longer in Adam, believer. You're in, you're in Christ. You're a child of God. But nobody pushed the clear button up here, did they? <laughs> Everything that was programmed into my memory is still there. Now do you see why Scripture says no longer be conformed to this world? Because you were. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you can prove that the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, there is no instant renewal button. And what we will explain later, there is no erase button. That's the most frustrating part. I don't mind starting over again, but I wish I could get rid of all the garbage instantly. But see, repentance literally means a change of mind. And uh, so essentially what has to happen is you got to reprogram this computer. With me? Everybody does. 
because it's been programmed to live independent of God. That's what characterizes the flesh. When Scripture says that the flesh wages war against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for they're in opposition to one another, the major characteristic of that is, is the flesh is a learned independence. It's self-will or self-rule. Whereas the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus, would never do anything on his own initiative, but everything proceeds from the Father. One of the great tests of Jesus was that even when tempted in every way, he would not uh, uh, do anything apart from the will of the Father. And, uh, and so everything, is, in that sense, proceeds from the Father, both Son and Holy Spirit. And you can go through the New Testament and see where Jesus said, I didn't come on my own initiative. I don't speak out of my own initiative. Holy Spirit won't either. And uh, frankly, the great temptation of Jesus was that the devil wanted Jesus to use his own divine attributes, independent of the Father, to save himself. And he said, get behind me, Satan. And uh, so turn this rock into bread. And, you know, he was dying of starvation. That was a legitimate temptation. But he said, that, but I only do that which proceeds from the mouth of God. And so consequently, what he demonstrated for us on this planet was how you and I, as a mortal human being, could live a righteous life, even in the face of temptation, if you're simply filled with God's Holy Spirit. That was the example he gave for us. How a man, in his own limitation at that time, dependent upon the Father, could live a righteous life. But it stronger... All sin, essentially, is an attempt to get you to live your life independent of God. It isn't the opposite sex. It isn't the apple in the tree. It's to get you to live your life independent of God, to do your own thing. That's the test. And, and that's why a lot of things that we can do in the flesh don't look that bad. Can you preach the truth in the flesh? Oh, yeah. That's where it's... Great to have a very discerning wife like mine who sits in the back room and goes like this. Ah. <laughs> and then it's really quiet coming home from church on Sunday morning and that bad, huh? You know? Oh, honey, I love you. Well, anyway, it's one of those. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can uh, teach in the flesh. You can uh, witness in the flesh. You can. Motives may be screwed up and everything else. Paul is even rejoicing in that. Remember his statement? He said, their motors are all screwed up, but hey, it's, we're still going out. So, you know, so yeah, you can, you can do a lot in the name of ministry in the flesh. You really can. And because um, I have, I know I have. Uh, a lot. Uh, now, let me illustrate that. When I was in the Navy before the Vietnamese War, gee, I got to stop saying that, man. It really <laughs> makes me old. Uh, we refer to the captain of our ship as the old man. Heard that terminology before? Now, my first tour of duty was actually in station ship out of Yokosuka, Japan, on a destroyer. And my first old man was a lousy old man. Actually, he was a drunken bum. Uh, he drank every night with the chiefs, came back more drunk more times than not, belittled the officers. It was a tough tour of duty. But if I was going to survive on board that ship, I had to do it under his authority relating to him as my old man. And uh, so you learn. You learn how to tiptoe and whatever else you had to do to survive. And then one day he got transferred off. Gone, gone. I never saw him again. I had no relationship with him. I no longer was under his authority. We got a new old man. It was a good one, actually. But how do you think I continued to live aboard that ship? At least for a while. Until I got to know the new old man. Now that process is going on in everybody's life right here, right now. There was a time when you were born as a natural person in this world where the captain of your fleet was the god of this world. You didn't understand it at that time, but uh, you were all dead in your trespasses and sins. And according to the scriptures, you were serving the son of disobedience that resided in, in all of us. I mean, we were essentially subject to the God of this world. And then when you came to Christ, all that changed. Uh, dramatically so. Uh, your mind, unfortunately, wasn't instantly renewed. Uh, that'll take some time. Uh, look at uh, Kathy cartoons. This is Kathy's mother. She goes back to her 25th high school, or 50th high school anniversary, and her friend said, uh, 
next one. Uh, next slide, please. And then the next slide, please. <laughs> and, uh, and being instantly obedient, there it is. You were always the prettiest one in our class, Sam. Well, you thought I was pretty, you snubbed me. Next slide. We didn't snub you, we were just too intimidated to speak to you. I spent 50 years trying to recover from low self-esteem because I thought you were snubbing me. <laughs> Isn't that silly? My entire personality has been formed around the wrong information. So is yours. See, how did this enter into pastoral care and kind of ministry? You're not going to see anybody or try to help somebody who hasn't been abused, who hasn't been rejected, who hasn't struggled through their teenage years, uh, you won't meet a one. And every one of that has shaped their understanding of themselves, of God. Uh, you've had father figures in your life that uh, could be so offensive to you to say our father is difficult because your perception of any authority figure, much less a male one. You often wonder why Catholics prefer to pray to Mary? I think there's a very natural explanation for that, actually. I mean, if you got an abusive father, who do you go to in your home? Who would you prefer to talk to, for that matter? In most cases, your mother. And, uh, and I think a lot of it lies right there. Uh, the perception of God as the father is distant, but Mary is human. She understands me, and, uh, and it's just easier to talk to somebody like that than it is to God the Father. And yet Scripture clearly says, who should we go to? Our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But to get there is going to require some rethinking in terms of what that father figure is or who he is, isn't it? I mean, do you want to approach a consuming fire? Is that your perception of God? Draw near to me. What, and get burned? <laughs> Seriously. So, you know, your perception of God, what, what you believe about God, is obviously going to affect your intimacy with him because if he to you is just a big judge and out to get you, you want to draw near to him? I mean, humanly, you won't even make an effort. You may jump through the hoops, but you don't want to get close to him. In my perception is, if you really knew God, you'd go running to him. Uh, you know, and, and look at our own culture, how that has shaped us in terms of our thinking. Let, let me illustrate this. I was so burdened by the fact years ago that all these hurting Christians all over the world had one thing in common. None of them knew who they were in Christ, like they were ignorant of their spiritual heritage. And uh, so I wrote this little book. It got retitled now, I think, Who I Am in Christ. But this, it's a great bathroom book. I mean, six pages long, you know, 36 chapters. And How long do you spend in there? I mean, it's about right for me, but I mean, that's... Uh... Anyway, it's a nice little devotional book, and... And it's, a, and it's a good book to put into people's hands when they become a Christian because we want them to know who they are. And it's going to affect, obviously, their relationship and their walk with God. Well, anyway, one of the chapters uh, kind of related to Romans uh, 5.1. Therefore, having been justified, we have peace with God. That's past tense. Having been is past tense. Uh, every reference to a believer, forgiveness, has already happened. You have been justified. I was trying to drive that home, and I had to go back to a time when I was in high school. Uh, I, I was raised on a farm and took a school bus into town in Minnesota. And uh, we had a thing on Tuesday afternoon called Religious Day Instruction. Uh, every Tuesday afternoon, the classes were shortened, and uh, the last hour, we would go to the church of our choice. I wasn't forced Christianity. You could go to uh, study hall if you wanted to. But I went to the church of my mother's choice. And um, one nice fall day, I thought I'd skip it. So I skipped it. I went out and played in the park. Came back, caught the school bus, thought I got away with it. I did not. The principal called me in the next day. This was scary, people. This guy even looked like Hitler, you know, beady eyes, a little mustache. And, well, he chewed me up and down, left and right. Then he concluded by saying, I've arranged for you to be off Thursday and Friday. Oh, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Expelled from school for two days for skipping religious day instruction? I was not looking forward to going home that night. I mean, the bus ride was long. The lane was long. And uh, I had other thoughts going through my mind. Like, get up tomorrow and pretend you're sick for a couple days, you know. 
Didn't think I could pull her off. Well, do your chores and pretend like you went to school, but hide in the woods, and my sister would rat on me. Well, I knew I had to face the truth, and in my case, I had to go where there would be some mercy. That would be my mother. And uh, so I said, Mom, I got expelled from two days from school for skipping religious day instruction. What? Oh, Neil, I'm sorry. We forgot to tell you. We called the school the other day and asked you if you could be off Thursday and Friday to help us pick corn. <laughs> I could have gotten away with this whole thing. God arranged it, I guess. No secrets or whatever else. Now, had I known that, would I have dreaded going home that day? Would I have dreaded seeing mom and dad, my authority figures? Are you kidding me? I'd have ran up that lane. Hi, mom and dad. You know, I'd have been happy as a lark. I didn't know that. To them, they were like a consuming fire. I was, I was going to face the authority figures, and judgment was coming. And a lot of Christians, people, live just like that. They live the Christian life like they're walking on glass. And if I make a mistake, the hammer of God is going to fall on me. Christians, the hammer fell. It fell on Christ. He died once for all. You are not a sinner in the hands of an angry God. You are a saint in the hands of a loving God who called you to come before his presence with confidence, with boldness, with your heart sprinkled clean. If you knew that, you would go running to your heavenly father. Yes. You would. But in your mind, if he's a consuming fire, what are you going to do? What would your natural instinct? Talk to somebody else about God for me? You approach him? <laughs> I said it would be like the eternal struggle of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob, you know, cheated his brother out of his birthright and goes up to, you know, another country for 20 years, bargains for one wife, gets another. Finally says, if this is all the religious life is worth, forget it, you know. So packed up his sheep and families and wives and went down to Padam Aram on the river Jebuk. It, uh, Place called Penile. Literally means face of God. He'll send his family and sheep across the Jordan, and then he rustles with the angel of the Lord all night. And he's struggling to get away. And then as the dawn breaks, the light comes on, he looks upon his face. It's not an angry man. He sees the faith of pure love. And the whole battle changes. And now he's not struggling to get away. He's struggling to hold on, isn't he? And uh, God reaches down and touches his sock and he limps across. And over here is Jacob. But over here is Israel. Everything changed. Everything changed. And it all changed because his perception of God changed. His perception of who he was changed. Frankly, he changed because he encountered God. And, uh, and so this has everything to do with, with, in, with your perception of God and, and of who you are in terms of how I live my life. Now, uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, weapons of warfare are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And we're a lot raising, or bringing, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, how are those strongholds raised up against the knowledge of God? Uh, even if you took secular theory in terms of attitude formation, I think there's general agreement. Remember now, you came into this world born dead in your trespasses and sins. And uh, so when you come into this world, the only world you know is that which you can see. And you at first can't even see that. <laughs> but it's just the environment around you. So by and large, our early childhood developments are just attitudes that you pick up from the environment in which you were raised in two ways. Primary way is through um, prevailing experiences. The home you were raised in, uh, the church you went to or didn't go to, the playground you played in. You know, I'm a grandfather. When little Sammy came into this world, my first grandson... I'm biased, but he was, he was raised in a nice family. I mean, all of his cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents all know the Lord. 
Well, it's the same church even. I mean, and, uh, and I can see what his worldview is. And you can see by the way he acts when he goes out in public because the world's a safe place by and large because that's the only world he knows. So he goes down the mall, hi, he just says hi to everybody. <laughs> now, he's 11 now. Times have changed and he's beginning to wake up. The kids can be cruel and call you names and all kinds of stuff. But, but I can see how that's affected him early on. Now take a little boy that's raised in a home where he doesn't even know who his birth father is. Mother has multiple partners. Some of them beat him up. What's his worldview? What's his perception of reality? What's his concept of God, of himself? Which one of those two boys needs the Lord the most? Both exactly the same. And, and never forget that, by the way. I said, truth of the matter is the second one may find it easier to come to Christ because he's a little desperate in need. Whereas little Sammy can be quite comfortable living in a, something less than a Christian home. Never see the need. This the same problem with a rich man. Doesn't see his need. But fortunately, Sammy did and had the privilege to baptize him. So, but uh, do you see the point, though, that, that you know, everybody here had no choice as to the family you were born into and more times than not, the only difference between you and that obnoxious person over there is he was raised in a set of environment that you'd be obnoxious to, probably. That's why we're not to judge. Because if you had a chance to actually have been subjected to what some other kid is subjected to, you would pretty well understand why they're snipping glue and everything else today. I mean, it's because their life is so desperate. And they're desperately looking for something, some affirmation. Give me some. None seems to come. And the ones that are most desperate are the ones oftentimes most repelling. So the very thing they need, we don't give them. It's really tragic. Uh, now, uh, it isn't just through prevailing experiences, which is the majority. It's also through traumatic ones. Now, they're burned in your mind, not over time, but they're burned in your mind because of the intensity of the experience, such as a rape or a death in the home, or divorce. Now what's interesting about that is, is because of the intensity of the experience, that can linger there for years and years. Now we'll come back to that next week, uh, what I call a primary emotion. Uh, but, but keep this in your mind right now. People are in bondage to past events, but not to the trauma itself. They're in bondage to the lies they believe because of the trauma. Now, I'll give you some examples of that later on, but keep that in mind. We ever think, well, that event made me feel this way. No, it's how they processed that event. It's what they believed about it. A little child, mom and dad go through ugly fights in a divorce, and you start talking to them years later, and who do they blame? Themselves or God, or mom, or dad, or somebody. And, um, well, one illustration of this may be worth it. It was in the uh, East Coast. Conference was over with, spoke Sunday morning in the church, and uh, second service was done. I had a lunch appointment, picked up my notes, last person I left, except for one remarkably attractive gal. I'm probably about 33 years old, and a prayer counselor was kind of talking to her, but she's, you could see she was crying. And I started to walk that direction, and she said, I can't deal with this now. I said, okay. I said, I have a lunch appointment. I started to walk away, and then she said, I've got to talk to somebody. So we got a more private place, and an older prayer lady, counselor, was there. And so we're in the back room, and she said, I went to your conference, but I'm not free. I said, okay. I said, how old are you? 33. I said, how long have you been a Christian? Uh, four years. I said, are you married? No, and I'm never going to be. Okay. <laughs> uh, I said to say some time, if you've been a Christian for four years and you went through college, she's a professional lady. I, I said, can I make some assumptions that chances are there's been probably some sex and drugs and maybe alcohol in your past? Oh, yeah. I said, do you feel you adequately dealt with that during our conference? I, I think I did. But I'm not free. I said, okay. Um, what is your earliest childhood memory? If you had to go back to a defining moment in your life that changed your direction one way or another, 
what would that be? Oh, she said immediately. Well, that would be when I was five, she said. That. I said, what happened? Oh, well, mom came home from the hospital with her third child, my youngest brother, and, and dad left us, just walked out on us. I said, okay, are you willing to go back there? Now, there's no false memory here, folks. This is, a, frankly, a very vivid, painful memory in her life. And I said, are you willing to go back there again? I said, um, I want you to do something. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to recall as best as you can that experience. Would you be willing to do that? Okay. And she sat there. I said, now, what, what do you recall? Describe the house. She did. The room, mother's holding her younger brother. Dad is cussing, walking out. Mom is crying, begging him not to leave. I said, what are you thinking? Now, here is a very professional, 33-year-old lady, been tough all of her life, actually. Tears are starting to flow down her face. i got to be strong. I'm never going to get married. I can't trust men. Um, there were several things that she shared during that time that uh, she still believed. I mean, it just marked her life. And um, I said, who else do you see? Jesus. I said, what's he saying to you? Nothing. He just has his arms out to me. I said, why don't you go to him? Now, this isn't a counseling session, folks. This is an encounter with God, which true Christian counseling should be, as we'll explain later. Well, anyway, uh, this whole thing's lasted now about five minutes, probably not much more than that. And I just led her through some renunciations. I renounced the lie that I have to be strong myself. I choose to believe that I'm strong in the Lord. I renounce the lie that I may, can't get married or can't trust men or a whole bunch of things that she had shared during that time. And I said, are you prepared now to really forgive your father, maybe your mother? And I think probably for the first time she really did. And then I just finished up with some simple stuff like submit yourself now to God and resist the devil and tell him to leave you. And when I've done, I wish you were there. I wish you could have seen her face. Uh, she was free, and you can see it in her face. And we talked for a little bit. I said, I'm old enough to be your father. I said, can I be your father for a moment? You've never really had a father. Sure. I said, well, honey, I would like you to get up in the morning and look in the mirror and like what you see. I would want for you to have a relationship with a God who made you that's honest and open. Nobody as a male authority figure had ever in her life talked to her like this, wanted the best for her, without, you know, scoring a trick or getting some meat. And, uh, and by now, she's just bawling. And I said, I, I, I want you to not be afraid to bring me a son-in-law and bear me some grandchildren. You know, I said at that time, <clears throat> Sammy, I think, was about two or three years old, my first grandchild, my second one had just come, and I knew how much that meant to me. I knew what it meant to her mother, for that matter. You know, I lost it. <laughs> I mean, I really did. I mean, to me, it was very emo emotional. Well, we prayed together, and we left. I never saw her again, but uh, that whole thing lasted 15 minutes. But I could, you can look in her face and knew she had just left the past behind her. But what she was actually in bondage to was all the lies she believed during that period of trauma that just hung on for years. i got to be strong. I'm not saying this out of a vacuum, folks. My 15-year-old daughter was raped at a school function by two boys. It led to a pregnancy. Uh, and my little honey carried that baby out and we adopted it out. My first grandchild is 22 years old. And... Uh, my next two grandchildren that she got after she was married um, knew they had a half-sister, prayed for her, met her two years ago. At the 18, they opened up their record. Uh, so we walk in the light. There's no uh, shame in these kind of things. You just uh, accept the hand that gets dealt you. But for about five years, Heidi would see something on television and men are perverts. Honey, uh, not all men are perverts. Well, I know you're not dad, but I said, honey, not all men are perverts. But it took her a while to work through that, as you can imagine. And, uh, but just during those trauma, the perceptions that we have of people, of life, of marriage, 
and all those things that come in traumatic experiences like that, your mind can be deeply embedded uh, with some things that just frankly aren't true. And what people are bondage to essentially are lies. That's why it's truth that sets them free. Mm -hmm. But if you can't get at the lie, chances are you may not know the truth that will set them free. But the key to all this thing is, is that God knows what they are. It's not a question of me trying to fish for them. It's a question of, of submitting to God. Now, we'll get the methodology a little bit later on. Um, now, what happens is all of us have strongholds raised up against the knowledge of God. Nobody here has a perfectly biblical perspective of who God is or even who they are, for that matter. I mean, God has knowledge about me I don't have. He knows how many hairs I have in my head. I don't know that. Another five years I will, you know. <laughs> As the numbers keep decreasing. <laughs> I'm getting down where I can cut them on my hand. But anyway, at, um, um, now what happens is, see, uh, here we are in this world, you know, we've all had past experiences, some good, some bad, and now we're new creations in Christ. And you're still living in this world. When the Bible says no longer be conformed to this world, recognize the fact that you still can be. Because the phrase would actually imply that, doesn't it? Yeah, right. You can still go to the wrong movies, have the wrong friends, do the wrong things. As a Christian, you can still program your brain in the wrong direction. You can actually do that. Um, now, since we are down here on planet Earth, we are going to be subject to temptation. Now, the key to all of that is learning to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Um, practice what I call threshold thinking. Because as soon as you're tempted, it always begins with a thought. You see something, you hear something. All that is is just input into your brain, but your brain says, I want that, or that looks good, or whatever else. But it always begins with a thought. Now, the key is to take that thought captive. Because if you don't, and you start ruminating on it or thinking about it, the path is pretty predictable, folks, <laughs> from there on. Uh, you know... If you got the PowerPoint up there again, let me, let me go to the next slide of cartoons. This is uh, Kathy. And uh, you'll be tempted in the next slide. Just click her down one. The next slide. If we could just keep that up, you can just keep cycling down all the way through this. That'll work fine. I'll take a drive, but I won't go near the grocery store. I will drive by the grocery store, but not go in. I will go in the grocery store, but will not walk down the aisle where the Halloween candy is on sale. I will look, but not pick up. I will look, I'll pick up, but not buy. Buy, but not open. Open, but not smell. Smell, but not touch. Touch, but not taste. Taste, but not eat. Eat, 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 eat. <laughs> and you've got an eating frenzy. And you say, come on, God, you promised to provide a way of escape. He did. Which rain? <laughs> Probably too late. What did it say? I will take a drive. Why do you think she's taking a drive? I mean, if you can measure it, she's already salivating. <laughs> okay? She knows what's at that grocery store. There's an unbelievable naivety in all of us. We think we can go from frame to frame and stop anytime we want to and turn around and go back. I said, I don't think so. I think there's a point when, uh, when you're not going to turn around. And chances are. Now, it's, po it's always possible. But the odds decrease dramatically every step you take. Let's suppose you're struggling with, with lust and you've got a porno addiction. And you leave here and you remember, oh, man, I need some milk. And uh, now, there's a Kroger's over here. There's safe environments to get milk. There's a little deli over here that sells milk and liquor and, and pornography. Now, you've got a choice. Uh, what happens is, you start heading towards that deli, chances are, it's too late. Because your mind has this incredible propensity to rationalize, you know. Well, if you don't want to look at that stuff, cause an intersection at the next crash, uh, crash in the next intersection. Or have a pastor there buying milk. Well, no crash, no pastor. Now, what's interesting is also is that sexually you are already stimulated long before you get there. There you are. I mean, the, the adrenaline and the rush is happening just because you're thinking about it, because you know what's there. And then you look around, you don't see anybody you know, so you look. And what happens when you leave? You put the magazine back, and you get your milk, and you leave. 
And the devil changes his role from tempter to accuser. You sicko, aren't you ever going to get over this? I'm never going to do it again until tomorrow. And you're in the sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess, I give up cycle. You'll never get out of it if that's all you have. You'll just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. It's not a complete cycle. And we'll explain later, but I said, confession is the first step to repentance, but it is not repentance. And, um, and don't tell me the devil doesn't have a role in this. He is the tempter, and he is the accuser of the brother. And, uh, but what he's doing is he's taking advantage of your flesh. He's operating essentially through your flesh. But your own thoughts, I want to do it. It's like a magnet, folks. It's like uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey in Homer's Island where the sirens sucked every person who came too close. You came too close. And you get that close, you're going to step over the line. And we just need to know that. We need to know that about ourselves. Now, as you grow and mature, you may be able to get closer in terms of ministry, but I, but I said, uh, by and large, folks, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You keep stepping over that line, and pretty soon you, you won't come back. Well, uh, now what happens is, is all kinds of things are taking place physically in our body. Uh, the moment that you think on something, you're triggering off all kinds of events in your own physical body. Now, in your, this is all in your syllabus, by the way. I should have told you that. It's on page uh, 16. Here's a more complete picture of your inner and outer person. Now, don't make this complex, but I want you to see this. Uh, obviously, God would create us that our inner and outer person would correlate with each other, right? Some of the correlation is very obvious. The brain, mind. Uh, now, again, I'm not getting into great physiological discussion here, <laughs> but, but this is really quite simple. I want you to see it because it all fits together in a moment or so. Now, what's the difference between your brain and your mind? Well, your brain is meat. Essentially, if you die, you'll be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Your brain would, re would revert to dust eventually, uh, but you wouldn't be with the Lord mindless. Now, that's a part of your soul not part of your body. Uh, now, the best illustration of this by far, in fact, it would be much harder to understand this 50 years ago, but today you got a powerful illustration of this. you got a computer operation, which has two very distinct components, hardware, software, right? Your brain would be the hardware. Your mind is the software. Now, keep that in mind, because later on, when we get to depression, which I personally believe is a mind, body, soul, spirit problem, it requires a mind, mind, body, soul, spirit answer. But if you want a kind of a detailed discussion, get our little book, Overcoming Depression, that looks at brain chemistry. Uh, but consider this for a moment. Uh, this little computer operation, because we're all in this process of being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Essentially, in a simplistic way, you are right now trying to reprogram your computer. This, so to see it from God's perspective, which is what wisdom is. Um, now, let me illustrate this. Uh, because the brain-mind combination, in our culture, in the secular world, doctors primarily, secular psychologists, pretty much are saying that any kind of a neurological problem that we seem to have is pretty much a hardware problem, and I can solve this purely by medicine. Now, can you have a hardware problem? Absolutely, no question about it. Organic brain syndrome, Down syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, bola between the ears, hard problem, hardware. Frankly, not an awful lot you can do about it. Trying to manipulate brain chemistry can be almost flat out dangerous, to be honest with you. Um, and there's no precise way to measure it. You have over 40 different neurotransmitters in your electrochemical system. The ones you hear about are serotonin and, and dopamine primarily, but serotonin seems to be most related to moods. But, uh, and only 5% is in your brain. 95% of your neurotransmitters are throughout your body. But there's where it's taking place in the sense. Neurotransmitters are, are um, signal carriers. That's the best way I can identify with them. Now, we're going to come back to this when we look at brain chemistry under depression because it's very critical to see 
what type of depressions that we have, whether it's related to the brain cell or to serotonin or whether it's simply due to sociological factors. Uh, but keep this in mind because we will come back to this. Um, if you look at it just this way, however, and read scripture, and let's say scripture is balanced, which is what I believe, is the emphasis on the hardware or the software? Oh, without question. I mean, sure you present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. Yes, you should have the proper rest and exercise and diet. I mean, I'm really believing in that stuff. But uh, when you look at what transforms your lives, it's the renewing of your mind. And, uh, and this is where the primary battle is at. And this is the one that you can win, because you actually have choice. Now, coming off of your brain-mind combination, coming off of your, your brain and your spinal cord, which is your central nervous system, is a peripheral nervous system. Now, this is as technical as I'm going to get, but when you see it, it's kind of fascinating which has two very distinct channels, autonomic and somatic. The somatic is what regulates muscular skeletal movement, Suma's body. Um, so gestures like this, speech, movement of hands, uh, would correlate with my will, wouldn't it? It's what I actually have volitional control over. Now the autonomic nervous system is what regulates your glands, of which you don't have direct volitional control over. I mean, you don't consciously say to your heart, beat, 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 or to your adrenal glands, adrenal, 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 or thyroid, 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 thyroid. They just do that, don't they? That's why they call it the autonomic nervous system. Um, all of your glands, your endocrine system, secretes horm hormones into your bloodstream. That's what, and they do it just kind of naturally. And uh, now that correlates to your emotion, of which you also do not have direct volitional control over. Think you do? <laughs> Try it once. I've never liked that guy, but from now on I'm going to like him. There's no way that you can will yourself to do that. There's no instruction to either that I know of. The commandment to love one another isn't to like one another. It isn't an ordering of your emotions. It's really an ordering of your will. I mean, you're really asking you to do the loving thing to love the unlovely. And only the grace that God can do that. That's why it's a new commandment is uh, because the love of God is not dependent upon its object, where phileo is, brotherly love is. That's what makes agape love unique. God loves me, not because I'm lovable, but because God is love. And, and that's the new thing that God has given you and I. You have now become a partaker of the divine nature. As you grow, you actually have the capacity to love the unlovely, to do the right thing on their behalf, whether you like them or dislike them. With me? That's agape. Very different from phileo in that regard. That's brotherly love. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even the heathens do that. That's phileo. That's natural. You know, I like that person because. I like them because they're fun to be around, or they're attractive, or they're like me, or they agree with me. You know? <laughs> That's natural. What isn't natural is to love the unlovely. That's godly. That's the next step. That's why a new commandment I've given to you. Because apart from the grace of God, humanly, we can't do that. It's not natural for us to do that. Uh, this is supernatural. And, um, well, anyway, um, now, putting these together then, for a moment, look at stress. Uh, God has created you and I to be able to somewhat physically respond to stress. The primary means by which we do that, or have that capacity, is our adrenal glands. When you come under a certain amount of stress in this life or pressures in life, your body tries to adapt to that and it will automatically secrete cortisol-like hormones into your bloodstream. That's where we get our fight or flight response to life. You know, the adrenaline rush uh, to run or fight or whatever. And uh, now what happens is if stress persists too long, stress becomes distress, our system breaks down and we can't keep up. Oh, uh, even the, almost every discipline, you know, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, pastors, have all been far more enlightened to that in the last 30, 40 years. I mean, dramatically so. I mean, the, the amount of stress that people are living under today far exceeds what we've had, I think, as the world has had for years. I, 
I can remember back when I was really young in ministry and that, that stress was considered sixth or seventh on the depth chart of causing cancer or heart disease. One or two now. Um, I remember writing a paper on stress years ago. It, uh, how many remember the Holmes Raw scale? Did that ring a bell with anybody here? One or two of you? Uh, it came out probably about 35 years ago, I guess, 30 years ago, maybe something like that. It, it was a scale. What they did was they artificially took the most stressful thing that a dog could have happen is the death of a spouse. And they artificially just put 100 behind it. Uh, death of a child, 90-something. Moving, 110, I think, after the summer, <laughs> but 90-something. Uh, but anyway, uh, they, they had a whole list of factors. The point was that if you took those and uh, you could identify, yes, yes, I had all these experiences this year, and you added up the numbers in one year's time, and it added to 300, you're going to get sick. Anybody know that ring a bell with more of you? Uh, is there some truth to that? Some. Some. Um, but it's not all the truth. In fact, to me, it misses the core truth. Um, why is it then that two people can be subjected to the same degree of stress and one actually flourish and the other one fall apart? Yeah. Is it because one has superior adrenal glands? Now, some differences there, yes. Some have greater physical capacity than others, that's true. But the major difference isn't here, it's right here. You are not affected by the environment itself. You're affected by how you perceive the environment. It's what you believe about it. Case in point. Here's a stressful situation. Israelites over here, Philistines over here. And the Philistines reason, we don't want a bloodbath. Well, let's just have our champions duke it out, winners take all. The problem is they got a giant and you don't. <laughs> and, uh, and so they're all freaking out over here. I mean, if you could measure the... Uh, Adrenaline rush, I'm sure, is pretty high. I mean, their eyes saw that giant. They heard him boast, and, you know, they're stressed out. And then along comes David. How dare you taunt the armies of the living God? And pulls out his slingshot and slays the giant. Now, there's several factors here that are important to keep in mind. Number one, David has history. He's got a learning curve. Because if you look at the context, and I thank God he put it in there, that he'd already seen God deliver him from the lion and the bear, if you remember the story. Now, that's important. Because faith is learned. You grow in your faith. And, uh, and your confidence in God increases too, for that matter, as you get to know him and yourself better. Um, secondly, the Israelites saw that old giant in relationship to themselves, but David saw the giant in relationship to God. Now, can faith have that kind of an effect on us? Oh, yes. I've, I've, seen, I've seen really, truly godly people under fire not fall apart. God's in charge. They have confidence in him. Well, I could die. Well, I'd be with the Lord. It's like asking, what's the worst thing I can do? I could die. Well, beloved, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. I would just be out of here with uh, brand new knees, resurrected body, no more asthma, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, hair, more hair. <laughs> probably, probably even sing on tune for a change, you know. So, I mean, you know, I don't fear death. We'll get to fear later on, but I'm well, looking forward to dying. That's a little different deal, but death, well, I'm afraid of death because I'm already alive and I always will be. Uh, now, put this all together because this is what's happening to all of us. Uh, what caused that adrenaline rush? Did that originate from the adrenal glands? No. No, they're slaves, essentially. That's part of your autonomic nervous system. Uh, did the giant cause that? Now, the tendency is to think that way, isn't it? Yeah, man, that guy freaked me out. Boy, well, didn't freak David out. Uh, so it wasn't the giant. See, what happens is your eye gate and your ear gate hears the boast and sees the giant. He is big. This is legitimate. We are under threat. Now, that signal is just sent to your brain. Is that what determined my response? No. No. It was the mind that interpreted the data. See, your, your computer can't function any other way than how it's been programmed. Be it done to you according to your faith, the Lord says. But it was the mind that interpreted the data, and it was that interpretation that determined the signal that was actually sent to my adrenal glands that caused the adrenaline rush. Now, 
moving ahead a little bit, when we get to depression, look at this later on, I said, go back to your computer for a moment and say, uh, gee, I got a Windows 98, and I want to put a PC, PX, what's the name of the one, X XP? And I, I wanted to, so I, I got the same old computer, same old hardware, and I load a new program in it. Would it, would it change the output? It would, wouldn't it? Something would come up on the screen that would be different? Did your computer change? Number of electrons in there change? Still weigh the same? <laughs> Did the flow of electrons in the computer change? Absolutely. That's, that's what determined this, the new signal. But the number of actual hardware components in there stayed exactly the same. The wiring stayed exactly the same. Chemistry, same. But the electron flow, the signal carriers, the same thing that happens. You come to Christ, new program. You've been given the mind of Christ. Uh, should the outcome change? Yeah. Do you weigh anymore? No. <laughs> That's the spirit. But when you reprogram your mind, you still have exactly the same number of brain cells, same number of input dendrites, same old axon, same number of neurotransmitters, but the flow of them changed. You with me? Nothing changed in the hardware. It was the software that changed. Now, can I fully explain this thing, how this happens? No, but nobody else can either. I mean, first of all, nobody's ever seen a neurotransmitter. I mean, there's no way to <laughs> precisely measure brain chemistry. I mean, I'm an old ex electrical engineer. I said, I remember when conventional uh, electricians thought uh, it went from positive to negative. No, it's negative to positive. Well, how in the world do you know? You've never seen one. That's true. <laughs> there is no microscope yet capable of actually seeing an electron. In one sense, it's theory. You know, it makes sense because they can predict it. They can see what the outcomes are. But So, look at sex. Guess where your, adrenal, your sex glands lie? In the autonomic or somatic? They're glands. That's right. Part of your autonomic nervous system. I knew I didn't have any control over that area of my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, in one sense, you don't. God created us male and female. Everybody here goes through a rhythmic sexual cycle of about every 90 minutes. Not very noticeable. But man, you can wake up in the middle of the night with an erection that has nothing to do with lust or sex or dreaming or anything else. It's just a cycle you're going through. Ladies also have one every 90 minutes. Less noticeable even. Uh, but you are going through one. Uh, but you also go through another one. In fact, Moody Bible Institute named their periodical after it. Moody Monthly. Uh, <laughs> that's not true? <laughs> Now, see, I don't know about you ladies. My wife doesn't plan that. She records it. She keeps a record of it. But See, that's just, that's, just a, that's just the way God created you. In and of itself, would that cause you a sexual problem, a lack of self-control? No. No. And God created us to be sexual beings. Going through those cycles is just part of our God-given chemical makeup. It's, it's a God-given thing that I'm attracted to the opposite sex. It's a God-given thing. It's, um, you know, God created sex. And then Adam and Eve, before they sinned, they were naked and unashamed. There were no dirty parts, nothing to hide. They could have intimate relationships right in the presence of God. That wouldn't have been no conflict to them whatsoever. It's we who made it dirty and distorted and, and sick and, and enslaving. Uh, but God created sex. It, uh, now, because of the fall, you know, we're in this mess. But to illustrate this, Look on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. It says, If any man looks after a woman in lust, he's already committed adultery in his heart. Therefore, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your ear offends you, your arm offends you, cut it off. Does your eye offend you? Does your arm? These are rhetorical questions. No, they don't. If that was the answer, everybody here would be lobbing off body parts. <laughs> and we'd all be a bloody torso rolling up and down the aisles.